this was a nice surprise. Um, woke up this morning, you know, first thing I do is check Woj's timeline because I'm a sicko. And I see that uh, Fred Van Vliet is appearing on the Woj pod. And so I tap in, knowing that Fred's probably going to talk about Toronto, knowing that Fred's a really good speaker, as we know, here in Toronto. And a couple of clips did really jump out uh, when he, Fred, spoke about his uh, free agency process. So I want to, to, to change the subject and get to those because I know he's already left the team, but it is interesting hearing from his perspective uh, how the free agency meetings went. So here's that clip. Did Toronto feel like a recruitment anymore? Uh, no, not at all. And I think that's that's part of it. And, um, you know, I have a great relationship with those guys, obviously Masai and Bobby. And, um, you know, I grew up in Toronto, um, I earned a lot of who I am there. Um, but again, you got to understand the situation and kind of know what's going on in, in the organization. And it was just a time where it's like, okay, it's starting to go around. Scotty is starting to go around some of the other young guys. And um, my value there wasn't probably as great as it was in Houston. And, you know, really that's all it boiled down to. So it definitely was not um, much of a, a, a buttering up in that in that uh, meeting, um, but I always give Masai credit for shooting straight and being honest and upfront. And um, you know you gotta you gotta commend him for that. And, and we've always had a great line of communication, and he was pretty pretty straightforward. You know. Yeah. What do you think about that idea? Yeah, I think you know that makes sense, and that certainly backs up how it kind of felt once free agency got going you know i i do remember you know hearing around those times that the, the raptors didn't give friend fred bedley no offers but once it got to 42 million per year mm -hmm. um it got a little tougher now there's also the weirdness of like fred's deal is technically two years in a team option um and things like that sure. um but yeah i i understand that however there is you know this once again kind of shines a spotlight on this incongruency between what the Raptors have actually been doing roster build wise and what they are saying. Mm, and Fred okay. saying, well, they were taking, you know, they were looking to the future. They're going to build. I think there's another quote where he uses the phrase start over. And those are the things you're talking about. But at the same time, they had just, so they were 26 and 30 at the trade deadline. Mm -hmm. And they decided at that trade deadline, trade a first round pick in a couple seconds for Jakob Pertl. Do not trade Fred Van Vliet for whatever might be available. Do not trade Pascal Siakam, Gary Trando, Gian and Obi for what might be available. It is four months later in real calendar time, but in NBA time, they only got a couple weeks more of information. Mm -hmm. They were one game over 500 after the trade deadline. Sure, it looked a little better with Jakob Pertl, but if that was your feeling and that was how you operated the trade deadline, and then you go to July 1st and that's your thinking with Fred Van Vliet, well, A, why didn't you trade Fred Van Vliet at the trade deadline? Because there hasn't been, there wasn't much more new information, and certainly not new information about Fred Van Vliet. Shocker, he looked better offensively with a pick and roll partner. We didn't learn anything new about Fred in those last two months. So why did the perspective on his situation change? And then if you turn around and you've said, we're okay, we did this at the trade deadline, put on the brakes, we're not going to re-sign Fred because it's not good enough. But then you also hear, well, they didn't really get very far on exploring Pascal Siakam trade uh, trade situations, Gary Trent trade situations. They re-upped Jakob Pertl, which they probably felt like they had to do because they gave up picks yeah, for him. Deal. But, like, they gave him, like, what... They gave him a contract that I thought was above what he was going to get. Now, market value is whatever you can get, but for your $78 million with some bonus upside for Jakob Pertl, they paid every dollar of the market value for him so there is this misalignment of what Fred is saying their their perspective seemed like, how they operated on July 1st, and what they did the rest of the offseason, what they had done the trade deadline prior. And it strikes me, Will, that we're headed for this exact same situation with Pascal Siakam. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's the thing. I mean, like, I, I can appreciate that the front office wants to move towards Scotty and the young guys. Do that's, it then. That's the direction. The thing is, I feel like they're unwillingly moving in that direction. They're being dragged in that direction versus they're choosing and to, to roll the ball in that direction. Again, the trade deadline last year is uh, that inflection point that they really needed to take, and they totally missed the exit there. But also at the same time, like this is one of the issues when you have with trading expiring players. I'm sure when they were looking around and calling teams of like, hey, what would you give up for Fred Van Vliet? It seems like his time in Toronto is probably over. 
at last year's trade deadline, teams are probably calling just as paying rental prices versus like, hey, here's an acquisition price for me to get Fred Van Vliet, right? And of course, that would also be contingent on you need to call his representatives, talk to Clutch, be like, you know, are you willing to resign here? What's the price look like? And I'm sure those discussions probably didn't happen to those large degree to the point where teams acquiring him would feel comfortable in getting him other than as a rental. That's why the trade offers were like Grayson Allen and some like, like pick swaps or something. Like it, that's, that's kind of nothing. Sure. Um, but, I mean, at the same time though, like, that's where the front office has to make that decision even coming into that point. And right? there's also the the quote, and I'm paraphrasing here from Aside that, you know, those trade offers they didn't engage with at the trade deadline would still be there in the offseason, which to me said they think they could at least get something in sign and trade for Fred. And look, I know that, and there was more James Harden talking this weekend as well. I know there was a domino where everyone thought James Harden was re-upping with Philadelphia because Daryl Morey had allegedly promised him a max extension. And if not, or even if via sign and trade, he was headed to Houston as a as a plan one B. And nobody really had looked at like we I think we talked a lot about Orlando as a potential spot to make a Fred play if they were ready to take the next step. We knew before the Beal stuff happened, we know Phoenix has always been high on him, Utah has yep. always been high on him. The Houston match and them having enough cap space to not require the bird rights of the sign and trade, and also being able to kind of tiptoe where they were still an attractive spot for a guy like Fred because hey we can bring in Dylan Brooks as well and you know here are the young pieces that we have that was a bit of an unknown scenario mm -hmm. but still there is to me this misalignment of the way you have operated at the two different ends of the last calendar year and the way you operated with Fred in the middle there's yeah. and again I'm not I'm not saying that this Raptors team would be better paying Fred Van Vliet 42 million dollars right now versus Dennis Schroeder for 12 million dollars it's more that that particular situation highlights this like lack of cohesiveness mm -hmm. in the strategy over the last calendar year. That's fair. Um, we have another clip here where Fred talked about his experience on the Raptors and him knowing that last year was kind of was was it. I felt that from day one that it was just a great fit and um, I was excited and no, it it, it was never easy. Um, it was you know one of the most difficult decisions I've made, especially as a professional. Um, in my life, but uh, I think more than anything, it was just like trying to look ahead and, and, you know, use a little foresight and have some vision about, you know, things that are going to happen down the line. And so I didn't want to be in a position where I was just signing a contract because the number was good and the contract was good. Um, I, I wanted to kind of position myself, you know, for whatever the second half of my career now is I'm going on my eighth year. So just kind of looking ahead and seeing, you know, the writing was definitely on the wall. And um, once we got to that point where it was like, okay, they clearly, you know, are going in a different direction. Um, this is not the situation that I was brought into and kind of nurtured in and cultured in and won a championship in. This is a different environment that they're, you know, they have to kind of start over a little bit. Um, and I would just want it to be somewhere where I could be myself all the way through and not like have to try to fit into a box, you know what I mean? And um, I think it was, it was best for, for all parties. Yeah, I think it was best for both parties because obviously Houston's very, very happy with what they're getting on their front side of things. Yeah, Fred's fourth in the league in, in assists per game right now, and he has right. just this monstrous assist to turnover. Over nine assists a game and only a turnover and a half. It's, it's been great watching him too. He's uh, made a bunch of clutch shots for them as well in a lot of these big wins for them. Um, also, he's run a nice two-man game with Shane Goon, which I think has really helped him sort of emerge as well. Um, but I think more importantly, Fred actually talked about later on in the interview, he, he said the culture's already changed. Whether or not we make the playoffs this year, how many wins we got, the culture in Houston has already changed. You can definitely tell uh, when you watch the Rockets. But from the Toronto side of things, when, when you hear him say that, and, and does that give you a little bit of trepidation in the sense that, like, the situation has changed? They want to start over with their culture? I mean, yeah. that's what they talked about, cultural shift, but, like... It is, and they use the term unselfishness, and, and you know, the... Uh, uh, to, <laughs> I did not enjoy watching this team play at the end of last year and I get that but I do you know I think Fred and Pascal being the guys who are held over like they were brought in during the DeMar Kyle we keep running into this block in the playoffs era and that was a culture that had been built by Dwayne Casey and DeMar and Kyle and JV 
And, you know, that was a good culture, but there was obviously an on-court sticking point. And then at some point, yes, a psychological sticking point against the Cavaliers. Like game one, 2018, yeah. broke them all. Sure. And it was yeah. never, they were never coming back from it. Um, but they experienced that and the type of leadership that Dwayne Casey provided from an organizational foundation level and the type of leadership that Kyle and DeMar provided, which, you know, Kyle obviously could be, you know, somewhat antagonistic, but also did a lot of stuff there quietly for guys to help them out. And DeMar was more of a, well, none of you are going to beat me to the gym, but you better show me that you're working and then I'll invest in you, that kind of thing. And then obviously the championship culture has to change a little bit because you, I mean, the goals have changed and, and the pressure has changed. You bring in a player like Kawhi, who is not as much of a typical leader, but has this kind of weight to his superstardom and his personality. You also surround that with Danny Green and Marc Gasol and Serge at that point has grown into a leader and stuff where, you know, culturally it's almost like the, the Expendables movie where like everyone has just come together. Like all these guys just need to win a title and they're on the last year of their deal or sure, almost yeah, at the yeah. end of their deal, almost at the end of their career. Um, and then pivoting out of that, you know, with, Hey, what does a Nick nurse culture look like? when Kawhi is not there and every single possession isn't the end of the world. And, you know, transitioning out of that, transitioning out of Kyle's leadership, you transitioned out of DeMar's leadership, you lost vets like Mark, Serge. Um, and you would hope, and the way that good organizations stay relevant for a really long time, is that all of that stuff would have stayed because of Nick, stayed because of Fred, stayed because of Pascal, stayed because of OG. And, and then those pieces that are then being added, you know, at least Malachi Flynn got the tail end of that culturally and things like that. And there has been too much erosion year over year. And as each piece goes away, you know, you hope that when Kyle leaves, say Kyle's imprint is left and the culture that he's helped build that that's still there. But it seems with each Kyle, with each Mark, with each Danny, et cetera, Norm, um, uh, too much of that w was eroded and didn't stick around. And I think that's probably what Fred's getting at a little bit there where he says, you know, culturally Houston made more sense for him and, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. No, very few teams. We talked about the other day, the Warriors having three guys who have been there forever. Like that just doesn't happen no. really. So these things happen, but it is, you know, as the Raptors continue to search for here, I think off court they're, they're getting the off court, cultural kind of reset is well ahead of the on-court one. Yeah. Um, but it's interesting to examine, especially as, you know, other teams who were behind the Raptors this time last year have managed to do that and take a further step on the court as well. Yeah. Um, and I think one way you can look at this too is just they have started to try to import culture. Let's bring in Thadia. Let's bring in Garrett Temple. And let's th let those guys be some of the leaders of the team. In years past, you didn't really need to see that happen. Partially because they did have a better roster and also they had more veterans, but their veterans are also able to carry that forward. So pretty uh, purposeful change. Um, and then the last clip here, uh, just Fred talking about last season, he said, quote, it kind of felt like a job. So I felt that from day one that it was just a great fit and um, I was excited. And I think that, you know, the first day was like I had to the itch and the joy because last year was such a drag for us that, you know, whether it was coach going through stuff or different players here and there, like it was just such a drag, you know, to get through the season that um, it starts to feel like a job. And um, that was my first year kind of being unhappy playing basketball. And most of it was due to my own play. And I'll take credit for that. You know what I mean? I'll take responsibility for that. But at the same time, it just wasn't a great season of basketball for us. Um, and so getting that, joy back was was huge for me again that joy back was huge for me um this guy's sean michaels he lost his smile yo alex uh, will get that reference i know you will, yeah I, I, he's just sitting there in the corner enjoying this but um yeah what did you make of that because yeah he, he talked about a lot of things that we kind of already kind of understood that yeah. nick was going through stuff the team was going through stuff it just wasn't that uh happy of an environment i, I think it obviously just kind of gets confirmed when it's sort of spoken yeah. like this but your thoughts on Fred's experience with the Raptors. Yeah, I mean, it's it's sad to hear it because obviously you want guys to enjoy being here, playing here, enjoy the city, enjoy the fan base. That's certainly something I don't think Fred was doing by the end. Um, now, there is also an element of, yeah, that's what the money's for. Like, you get paid really well and you got to cash in after the offseason, so it can't feel too badly for you. But I think that, you know, big picture, you want your organization, even in a 500 season, to be somewhere that 
people can find themselves and be true to themselves and enjoy themselves. Um, so, you know, that that's something that, you know, maybe Darko's more personal style of leadership is going to help usher back in where guys are comfortable here and having fun here. Um, the truth, though, is, as you and I have talked about a lot, winning is fun and losing is not fun. And a lot of what Nick Nurse felt, Masai felt, Scotty felt, Fred felt, et cetera, probably is a lot different if they win four or five more games last year and they're out of the play in and they get an actual playoff series. And even if they don't win, like yeah. that, like the on court slog is still there. But if they win an extra game every couple weeks and they're a little higher in the standings and they make the playoffs, it, it's just the margins are that small sometimes. 